Okay, welcome back to the next um, lesson on the in the modern physics playlist. And today we'll be continuing on the ultraviolet catastrophe. Now, in the previous um, segment, I talked about the problem that arose that arose from the ultraviolet catastrophe, and that problem was this difference in between the ex the theoretical curve of how um, of how the curve should act um, in the ultraviolet spectrum and between that and the actual experimental evidence and the U the UV catastrophe basically stated that um, that ultraviolet waves should dominate because of this curve like it went all it goes all the way up to infinity and we know that this isn't true because in everyday life we don't um, through experiments we can we, we a scientists have found out that um, this curve, this light blue curve, is actually the case, not this dark blue curve. And this was the ultraviolet catastrophe. Now, how was this solved? Okay. How was this solved? And this was solved by a guy called Max Planck. And I'm sure you've heard of him before. You know, Planck's constant and everything. This guy is pretty famous in quantum physics. Anyway, so. Do you guys remember back um, in the previous segment when I said that Rayleigh postulated that um, in a metal, a metal consists of little oscillators that um, that vibrated at a some sort of frequency. So basically, what um, Rayleigh's model was of what Rayleigh's model of a metal was that it consists of tiny little oscillators that vibrate it with a certain frequency, and this results in the and this frequency that they vibrate in results in the frequency of the light that was given off. Okay, Max Planck Max Planck basically used this same model, and what he said remember the equation that Rayleigh produced from that model. Um, where is it? There we go. This one, this one right here. Um, basically, Max Planck expounded on that equation, and what he said, what his equation was, he said that the function, did I use the function back in the other one? No, I did not. Okay, so I'm just going to ignore using the, the function here. Okay, so basically, what Max Planck's um, equation was, was this, um, basically using the same variables. He said that this was proportional to the Q of the frequency multiplied by <coughs> multiplied by this E H F over K T minus one. Well, well it's commonly written as this actually, um, which but it's ex exactly the same thing though. Q and then. E H F K T minus one to the negative one, which is basically the same thing. Anyway, so from this, what you need to know from this equation is that as the frequency of the wave of the light wave approaches zero, so as it gets long, as, as it gets shorter, as 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 the frequency gets lower, what does E get up to E H F over K T approaches one. And what does this result into? This results in the whole function approaching infinity. Now let, let me explain how this works. So if frequency approaches zero, it will be actually this will approach to E to power zero. And E power zero is one, right? Anything to the power of zero is one. Therefore, as f as frequency approaches zero, e to the power of this approaches one. And since e to the power of zero goes one, we know that f cube over e to the power of zero minus one. And since we know this is one, so this would become f cube over one minus one equals to f cube over zero. And this approaches infinity, right? This approaches infinity. Now, what if at, um, frequency gets higher. As frequency gets higher, um, E H F 
over kt approaches infinity because it'd be e to the power of infinity, which is infinity. And what does this mean? It means that, oh, whoops, it means that this function approaches zero. Why? Because f cube will be over infinity minus one. And infinity minus one is basically f cube over infinity. And this results in zero. All right? Okay. So now that we've um, like we've examined what this function means, now let's now let's uh, look into how this solves the problem. So, on top of finding out this this whole um, this function, this equation, and how this works, um, Planck went further into explaining what his function actually meant, and through this and uh, through his, his explanation he ended up with the ultraviolet catastrophe again and this was how he and this was how so from his equation he said remember how he used oscillators similar to Rayleigh from his thing he from his um postulate postulate Max Planck said that Max Planck's equation would would predict that oscillators may have any frequency right it has no bounds on, on the frequency given a wave can have any frequency but since uh, it can have any frequency then this must also predict that the number oh not numbers number of ways to oscillate for the for any oscillation in the metal to oscillate is proportional to f squared and this is similar to the to the one by Rayleigh right here, proportional to f squared. Okay, and what this means is that most of the oscillators will have a high frequency because as because as frequency goes up, the the number of ways to oscillate goes up. So therefore, most oscillators will have a high frequency. Which makes sense. So these are the. This is how the. This is basically the logical order of how his, um, of what, of the predictions of his of Planck's um equ of, ugh, man, I'm messing this up. This is basically basically the logical order of Max Planck's predictions. There we go. That wasn't too hard. Okay, and then from this third one, this would predict that UV waves should dominate because UV waves have a high frequency and since and since from this postulate right here it says that high frequency should dominate so therefore UV waves should dominate which we know is not true and this is the ultraviolet catastrophe so through Max Planck's um, equation he got right back to the ultraviolet catastrophe and it solved nothing at all and Max Planck thought about this and thought about this and he created up with another with hit another explanation now, and this basically solved, and this next part solves the ultraviolet catastrophe. Now he he modifies his, his assumptions and said that energy, and this is basically quantum mechanics, energy equals quant no not equals energy. Let me erase it completely. Okay, energy is quant Tized. Energy is quantized, and what this means is that energy occurs in discrete amounts, and this can be shown. And I think I have explained this in the previous in the lesson one. What quantization means is that think about this: if from get to point A to point B, which is like some height above, let's say you you want to get from the the first floor to the second floor. One way to get there is by a, by a slope, by a ramp, to get from point A to point B. Point B. Another way is to use the stairs, right? To get from point A to point B. Both both ways have the same method. I mean, will eventually get you to point B. But the method, the way of getting there is different. This one, you can go, you can step anywhere you want on this slope, and it doesn't matter. However, for this one. 
you can only step on this spot, this spot, this spot, this spot, this spot, and this spot. So this would be called continuous because you can step anywhere you want, and this would be called discrete because you can only step on at certain areas. And this is this discrete idea is basically quantization. So energy is quantized. And he said, Max Planck said that um, each oscillator, remember the oscillator in the metal that vibrates at a certain frequency, each oscillator, the energy of each oscillator, oscillator, is an integer number of some value epsilon or E, right? Thus, where okay, so where n is a mem member of integer of the integers, so the energy of any oscillator can occur at only cer certain discrete values, where n equals zero, n equals one, n equals two, but nowhere in between. n cannot equals like zero point five, zero point six, etc. Right, and this is represented through the steps. It can only occur at n equals zero, n equals one, n equals two, and and so forth. Okay, so what does this all mean? Well, if we use the earlier equation just now, and we see that, and we modify it slightly, this is what happens. So the relative probability that an oscillator will have some energy E would be equal to 1 over E to the power of epsilon over kt minus 1. Now, let me pose a question to you. What if E1 equals kt and epsilon 2, okay, this is not E, I'm just say epsilon. Epsilon 2 equals to 5kt. Is this, is this even, even called epsilon? I don't know. I just always associate this with epsilon. I might, I might be wrong, but uh, please excuse me because I do not study Greek. Okay, so if this was the case, how much more probable, how much more probable is E1 than E2? How much pro more probable is it to have a lower um, energy than a higher energy? Higher how, how how much more probable is it to have a lower heat energy than a higher heat energy? So how much prob more probable is it for an object to have a lower temperature than one to have a higher temperature? And let's use the equation. So relative probability of E1 over relative probability of E2 equals, and what we get, we get one over E power of E1 over kt minus 1 over 1 over e power e2 over kt minus 1 and we solve this you, this one comes up top this one comes below so we will get e power e2 and now e2 is actually 5 kt over kt minus 1 over now this one comes back to the bottom so be e to power off and now e E1 is KT, so KT over KT minus 1. Cancel off, cancel off, cancel off, cancel off. We get E to the power of 5 minus 1 over E to the power of 1 minus 1. And we can conclude that E1 is definitely more probable than E2. And this means that it is more probable to have for an oscillator to have a lower energy. And knowing this, this means that as E increases, as E as E increases, relative probability decreases right so as e increases relative probability decreases so what this means this results in that very few combinations have large energy few oscillators have 
large energy. And assuming that all combinations of, of energy and oscillations are equal, this would mean that it is very unlikely, very unlikely to have large energy. And this is tight. Oh, whoa, I, I reached the end of my document. Okay. And this is tight through Max Planck's equation. And this is how he wrote it. Max Planck wrote this. E equals NHF. Where H is Planck's constant. Which equals 6.63 .6 times 10. To the power of 94, 34 joules second. And f is the frequency, and n is what well, I said earlier, just in um, in integers 1, 2, 3, 4, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, all that kind of stuff. So, therefore, assuming, and now we're almost at the end here, I know it's kind of stretching, the video is kind of long now, but I'm, I'm wrapping it up. Assuming the following assuming a energy levels of the oscillators. Uh, quantized meaning that they can only occur at discrete amounts and this would mean that few oscillators have high energy as I explained earlier and assuming B that energy depends on frequency we can conclude the following which results in the ultraviolet catastrophe disappearing it disappears this would mean th this all would mean that few oscillators have high energy which would be and this would mean that few of them few metal objects emit waves with high energy because we know that the frequency of the waves that are emitted are equal are the same as the frequency of the waves of the I mean the frequency of the oscillators and since few waves have high energy and we know that energy is proportional to frequency we know that few emit waves with high frequency and this means that there are few UV waves which concludes the ultraviolet catastrophe and the ultraviolet catastrophe disappears in a puff of smoke boom done and Max Planck solved it and how did he solve it with quantum mechanics he assumed that the angel energy levels are quantized and this was how he solved it quantization was the heart of the matter and okay so that's about it that's basically how the ultraviolet catastrophe was solved and in the process quantum mechanics was born so hopefully you guys um, enjoyed that and I'll see you guys in the next episode peace out